Standard disclaimer before I start this video, this video is going to be heavily analytical and I'll be looking at the entirety of Dragon Ball Super, particularly with the last arc, the Universe Survival arc. So if you have not watched Dragon Ball Super, I'd recommend pausing this video and going to do that right now because I will spoil a lot of what happens in that arc. Standard disclaimer. Guys, let me just say this. Dragon Ball Super isn't the best. It's certainly not a bad show in any way. In fact, it's totally justified if you say it's your favorite anime of all time. But it has some obvious flaws in many aspects, and I'd just like to talk about them quickly. Because there's been this trend in society where if someone doesn't say that a specific something is absolutely perfect in every way, the rest of the world accuses them of hating that thing. This is stupid for a lot of reasons. Mainly because all things have some sort of shortcoming that prevents it from being the most perfect thing in the world. However, that's a good thing. I would rather everything be flawed in the slightest of ways than everything being totally perfect all the time. Because once something became perfect, everything that followed it would become mathematical in structure and would then cease to be art. Life would become boring. Everything has flaws, so it's generally a good thing to point them out when they arise, no matter what they are. It doesn't take away from all that it does right. It instead emphasizes all that it doesn't do wrong, and more importantly, helps the audience make rationalized opinions on whether or not they like that thing. And that leads me to Dragon Ball Super. Right from the start, it was clear that some things about this show would not be on par with many Dragon Ball fans' standards of quality. Sure, it would be entertaining to see all your favorite characters in fresh, modern animation, but plenty of things could be enjoyable and still not be super good. Even at the time I watched it, back when I didn't really develop my critical eye at all, I still found issue to be had with the Goku vs. Beerus fight that spanned over several episodes, for example. Namely that not a lot happened in it, and the stakes kept fluctuating so much that it was hard to keep any interest in the outcome, especially when I and so many others already knew the outcome, because we had seen the Battle of Gods and Resurrection F movies that this arc and the next were direct remakes of. And while things did get better, I personally feel that the improvements made up to the universe survival arc barely made a difference in my enjoyment of the series as a whole. Actually, that seems to be the biggest issue I have with Super as a whole. The arc wildly claimed to be the best in the entire series is oddly... boring? Not to mention inconsistent in its quality. Following the series week to week, there were several instances where I flat out stopped watching new episodes for a couple weeks or a month, only to hear that no 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 no, there's actually exciting things happening again. I honestly cannot fathom how people kept watching that arc week to week. But that's not to say that I'd necessarily disagree with people who did. As someone who's been a Dragon Ball fan for the majority of his life, and someone who claims to have a modicum of intelligence, it's pretty frustrating to see a Dragon Ball show flat out insult its viewers by assuming they can follow any line of logic, you can taste the air quotes there, presented to them. And to properly explain that, I believe the best place to start is the structure of the tournament itself. It's flat out incoherent. The idea of a battle royale where only one is the winner and everyone else is killed should sound pretty familiar at this point, but it holds up even worse in comparison to those awful, awful games. See, in those games, the action is so fast paced and there's so much happening at once in so many different places that it's downright impossible to follow all of it. But you aren't meant to. Even as a spectator, it's best to only follow one person and see what they are doing and not flick back and forth between viewpoints following other people. If two people that you've kept in mind happen to intersect, then you get the best possible scenario. But in Super's case, it just doesn't mix well. None of the characters from any of the universes that we're supposed to care about are meant to serve as pure fodder, arguably. They all have interesting and unique designs, motivations, and best of all, crazy powers. Seeing one fighter split himself up into five illusions, and seeing another act as a reflector to redirect someone else's energy, while a third is flat out too small to see and wrecking face, is just damn cool to see in action. But maybe they are pure fodder after all. 
Because so little of the fights that occur during the tournament do anything to progress the narrative in any meaningful way. And most of the ones that do involve this asshole. That's right, I'm blaming a significant amount of the problems in this arc on Jiren. The most emotionally dead wall you've ever seen in your entire life. And I am including half of all walls in the entire city of Detroit. But why? What is it about Jiren that makes him the issue of an entire arc? The answer comes from these basic questions. What are his motivations as a character? And what does his existence do to directly or indirectly progress the plot? I'll put this simply. Jiren is as bland as bland gets. We're told right from the very beginning that this guy is the guy to look out for, and he doesn't even do anything for the first half of the tournament. It's only when he blows away that liquid guy with one punch to the air in front of him that he cements himself as a threat. Before that, he just sat on his ass and meditated for no reason. But then it leads into the two episode special, and it's from that point onward that Jiren fully establishes himself as the wall for my previous metaphor. He is depressingly, unbelievably, infuriatingly boring. And I say that because there's nothing about his personality that cues him in to be a real character. His only motivation and reason for existing is because strength trumps all else. And I would argue that no, no it does not. Because in a shonen anime that makes you out to be the main antagonist of this tournament, having a tangible sense of personality more or less outweighs anything else. Case in point, look at the character of Thanos. He too fills the role of the unbeatable wall that no one else can hope to defeat. But we actually like him because unlike Jiren, he has very clear motivations and an actual personality that causes us to genuinely feel for his cause. Someone may argue that I'm only using those two comparisons, Thanos and Fortnite, because they're popular and everyone's talking about them, and you may be sick of hearing them. And while I won't say you're wrong about that, only one of those things is actually good and I use them solely because they are popular and therefore easy to relate to. It's easy to understand my point that way. With no defining presence half the time and no personality to mark him as a character until basically the end of the series, it's easy to see why this guy sucks. But it gets worse, because the entirety of the arc story begins to revolve around him after the episode 109 and 110 special. He has shown his power as being above everybody else, and now he's become the person to eliminate to have a chance of survival. But towards the end, it all starts to fall apart. The natural progression of the tournament and the progression of the fight between Jiren and whoever has the balls to fight him are supposed to intertwine here, but they don't. Having a time limit in a tournament like this makes sense, and aside from the fact that 48 minutes is an oddly specific time to choose, it could realistically make for some interesting fight dynamics between characters. Like when Android 17 keeps blasting Toppo with energy blasts because his are unlimited, so he can keep firing them off until time runs out, securing his universe the victory. That's an interesting plan, unfortunately undercut by Toppo's unveiling of his deus ex machina god powers. As an aside, that is a really cool thing that Super added. The idea that gods aren't just born randomly, and if you fall under the category of life forms that possesses godly potential, you still have to sacrifice something very dear to you to fully realize said god powers. But back to the time limit. The staff of Super decided to forego the use of interesting fight mechanics and intricate dynamics between fighters, and instead used it more like a measuring stick detailing what should really be focused on and marking those moments by the slowing of time passing. That didn't really matter at the start of the tournament, but after episode 110 starts to become apparent, and by the time there are only two universes left, it becomes painfully obvious. Now what exactly does a time limit have to do with why I think Jiren is a complete flop of a character? Well, once it became apparent that the time limit isn't there for world building reasons, but instead, for storytelling reasons, I knew it didn't exist to make sense. It existed to mark the exact second that Goku would beat Jiren and secure his universe to win. The majority of the actual Jiren vs Goku fight takes place in the last 8 minutes of the tournament, and Jiren doesn't release his full 100% maximum absolute power for realsies until the actual last minute of the fight. 
Here's a scenario that could make the ending three episodes way more interesting. Instead of just letting us know, the Grand Priest calls out the minutes left in the tournament at important times, and then every minute during the last ten. That way, the tension of the fight is turned up even more. In this scenario, it's down to the final person from Universe 11 and the final three from Universe 7, and neither side is giving an inch. With Goku pressing the offensive on Jiren, he can't run off and quickly eliminate the exhausted Frieza and 17. And with so little time remaining, the only perceivable way he can win is to put sheer numbers in his favor. So it's 3 to 1, and his entire universe is on the line, so he doesn't have the time to play games anymore. He can't hold back anymore. As he gets pushed farther into a corner, he gets angrier, scarier, more desperate and violent, even willing to seemingly deal a near killing blow to Goku. And then obligatory Ultra Instinct, because the writing team realizes that at that moment, Jiren is more powerful than any god, and Goku and team have to win the tournament in the end. Hey, it was pretty high, but it deserves to stay. The point is, this changes up the entirety of the tournament and the way being in it affects the combatants, not just Jiren and Goku. It makes us feel for Jiren and grow to care for his struggle and opens him up to let everyone see his true motivations, even if there's something simple like, I have to protect my universe and keep the promise I made to my best friend Tapo who's always been there for me and who I owe my life to. It ultimately doesn't matter what his actual motivations for being in the tournament are, as long as we can see them and they aren't stupid. Arguably one of the best parts about a well-written antagonist or rival, or whatever, is seeing them crack. If they're putting on a persona or relying on one thing and one thing alone to get what they want, breaking that persona or shattering that thing, what does that person do then? The problem is still right there in front of them, and they need to deal with it right now, but have lost the one tool they had to do it. So what is their response? Get this part right, and people will at least remember that character. Screw this up, and that character loses all narrative meaning. This is why I adore villain characters in fiction, because that response has almost limitless possibilities, and are more often than not immensely interesting and entertaining. If you want to know what makes a good villain or antagonist, play Borderlands 2 and seriously study Handsome Jack. Yes, he is a horrible person, yes, he is the bad guy, and yes, he spends the entirety of the game trying to get you killed, but god damn if he doesn't make me feel for his cause in the end. When you oppose his cause, he reacts by sending more and more killer robots at you, and when that doesn't work, he summons something that I can't say because of spoilers. Seriously, play the game, it is so good. And when that doesn't work, he completely breaks down, unable to grasp the fact that he's lost, screaming out, You are a bandit, and I am the goddamn hero! Coupled with his actions and his interactions with you throughout the entire game, it's clear that he's riddled with so much personality that in the end, it's hard not to like him. Unlike Jiren, his tool that he uses to solve any problem is simply strength. Being a strong boy. It's why he's fighting in the tournament, it's why he joined the Pride Troopers, the greatest fighting team of justice since Power Rangers, and it's what he turned to as a coping mechanism for his childhood trauma. So it's no wonder then that he's constantly babbling on about only strength can be relied on in this world, which is only an interesting ideal when it is shown to be unreliable. As is the case of Goku swimming in Ultra Instinct juice for 30 minutes. But in response to his only reliable tool being broken, he simply pulls a bigger one out of his ass and claims that this one is the real one and this one can never be broken. And when it's broken, he's eliminated, gives up, and dies with the rest of his universe, only reeling at the fact that he lost a fight. What a guy. Now I've spent the overwhelming majority of this video talking about Jiren because the way the arc was written didn't really give me any other choice. Even before the tournament started, it was brought up by Tapo that Jiren was the guy to beat. And literally half of the tournament is based around him and his fight with Universe 7. So in the end, if he isn't a good character, the fight isn't good. And if the fight isn't good, the arc isn't good and you've just wasted your audience's time. Now you may argue against that, to which I would respond with this. If Jiren was a character in real life, our real life... Would you genuinely care for him? Or anything about him? 
This is my thought process for beginning to analyze important characters, and I encourage everyone to do the same. You'll have a lot more fun out of so many characters in media. After nearly seven pages of digging deep into Jiren and the problems with super storytelling and character writing in the Tournament of Power, I feel I should leave you all with this fact. I love Dragon Ball. I have all my life, and I always will. As a franchise and as a series, it may mean much, much more to others than it does for myself, but I will always love it for what it is. And it's that love for Dragon Ball that prompted me to write this video in the first place. I bash and lampoon the points I do because frankly, the show deserves better than those points. Dragon Ball Super is great, but it deserves to be better. It deserves to be breathtaking. And one day, I believe it will be. But to do that, we need to take a critical look at it and examine all of the things it does wrong. Because in doing that, we get knowledge that we can use to make it right. Hey guys, it's me. Sorry about the audio quality. I'm currently recording off my phone instead of my actual good setup. It is past 3 in the morning and I am so tired. I've spent so much time working on this video and I really hope that you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching and just sticking around for the entire thing. That means so much to me. Uh, oh, hello, cat. Sorry, one of my cats is rubbing up on my leg. So, uh, if you at all enjoyed what you saw today, consider dropping a like. And if you really like uh, the videos that I, if you really like what I've been doing, uh, consider subscribing. Because your viewership means a lot to me at the point that my channel's at. So, thank you so much for watching. Until next time, I will see you later.